I'm going to roll back the clock, in fact, about 15 years. And I was young, free, single, dating, actually. Um, I'd met this wonderful boy on holiday, and we were united in a love of traveling outside of the city. We were Londoners, working very hard, and desperate to get out of the weekends. And we wanted to find these places out in the countryside that would speak to us as a 30-something couple. And you have to remember back then, we were going through a bit of a design revolution in our homes. IKEA had started, Conran. And so we were chucking out the chintz in our homes and redesigning them, but the hotel industry just had not caught up. And so there we were. We would get these brochures through the post, because that's how you did your research back then. Anybody remember that? Um, and we would find a hotel and go, right, let's try this. And after a particularly busy weekend, uh, in London, working hard. We found a hotel, and it looked perfect. There was a picture of a person being massaged. There was a swimming pool. looked like it had good food. And um, so we got in the car. We chose it. We drove there. And as we drove up the drive, everything looked great. It was a big old country manor house, beautiful surroundings, great gardens. And we walked into reception. And you have to remember at this point, please, that we are dating, one of our very first dates. And we walk into reception, and the receptionist says, come off with me into this little room. And we both go into this room. And in front of each other, we are weighed. And they tell us our weight. That's not a good start to a date weekend away, I'm telling you now. And so we walked up to the bedroom, and the bedroom was slightly disappointing. And I looked at him, and I said, look, let's just have a great meal. Let's go and choose a fantastic bottle of wine. The dining room looked great. And so I got my dress on, I put my heels on, my makeup, glammed up. We went down, and as we sat down in the fabulous dining room, we realized that the other guests sitting down were all in their bathrobes, and the menu was a calorie-controlled diet and no alcohol. And so, like naughty school children, we crept past reception down to the nearest pub for a pie and a pint. And I think what we had realized is that we were seeking hotels where things were a bit different. We were looking for places where it wasn't about stars or diamonds or rosettes. It was about the experience. Hotels that really cared about how you feel as a couple going in there. We were looking for places that were original in terms of style, in terms of design, in terms of architecture. And we were looking at places that really place a focus on the important things. And when I say important things, I mean things like, can you get two in the bath? Will the shower get me wet? Are the sheets Egyptian cotton? And what's the thread count? And can the barman mix me a perfect martini? Now, these are important things that make up the experience. I don't want to know necessarily where the nearest rock formation is, because frankly, I'm going to be in the bedroom most of the time. And we wanted hotels that focused in on the detail. And I put this picture up because it's one of my favorite hotels in the whole world. It's Fogo Island in Canada. And when you've got a hotel in a situation, in a position like this, you get icebergs floating by quite regularly. And the hotel have created a little hammer that they give to guests. And the guests can go out and chip off a little bit of ice from the floating iceberg, which is, tend to be huge, and take it back in and use that ice in their cocktails. And I can tell you, it's the number one thing that all their guests talk about. It's the little touches that really matter. We were looking for places that inspired us, sometimes just because of where they were. This is Post Ranch Inn in California, Big Sur. And the structure that they have created, floor-to-ceiling glass, and then the, the, the wooden beam structure is built from the redwoods that actually surround the property. And so when you go from the forest outside to the inside of the structure, you can still smell the redwood. And this structure is leaning over the cliff edge, so you feel like you're really part of nature. And we were looking for places that were, wow, architecturally as well. Now, I remember when this hotel, Alila Villa Zuluatu in Bali, the pictures came through into the office. There was a kind of murmur around the office. Everybody was going, oh! 
And now, I didn't know that I needed a, ho a holiday in Bali until this picture landed on my desk. And then I realized that I needed to be there. Um, this structure, they call it the birdcage, and that is where you have your sundowners. I spent most of my time there actually figuring out where the best place to hide would be at the point of checkout so that I would never have to leave. We were also looking for places with a conscience, places that really think about their footprint, places that were going above and beyond, not just in terms of service and the importance and the details, but really thinking about the future. This hotel, Suniva Fushi, has a waste-to-wealth policy. That means that they are making profit from their waste. And it's not just because they want to make more money. It's because they have realized that all the islands on the Maldives are getting decimated by the tourism and the building of luxury hotels. And they realize that none of these hotels are going to care about what they're doing to the environment unless they think about it in a radically different way. Now, if the hotels can make money out of caring for the environment, suddenly they'll sit up and take notice. And they don't just do this for themselves. They invite all the other hoteliers in the Maldives to come in and learn, and they teach them about how they do this and how they can turn their waste into profit. And, of course, we were always looking for those places that simply change the status quo, and we're just a bit crazy. And talking about changing the status quo, that is how Mr. and Mrs. Smith was built. And Mr. and Mrs. Smith, I don't know if you know, the name is obviously the most common name uh, in English. And so it was the pseudonym that you would write down in the guest book if you didn't know, if you didn't want people to know that you were actually staying in the hotel with someone you weren't married to. Because in those days, it was frowned upon to stay with somebody outside of wedlock, even if you were planning on marrying them later down the line. Um, and so, of course, we're not allowed to talk about sex because we're British, uh, <laughs> so we called it Mr. <laughs> and Mrs. Smith. <laughs> and so we did disrupt the guidebook market at that time. I came from a marketing background, and so I didn't think it was fair, right? Our distribution uh, places were Waterstones, the big bookshops in the UK. I thought, how unfair. Why do they get to keep and talk to the customer? It's my book. I've put all this work into it. Why can't I talk to the customer? And so in the front of every book, we put a membership card. And that membership card tied everything together. It tied the customer to us and to the hotel. If the customer then presented the card to the hotel on check-in, they would get a little extra. Nobody else had done this before. It's hard to believe right now. And so it allowed us to communicate with our customers. And it was partly that reason why we transitioned and pivoted the company from offline guidebook publisher to online travel agent a couple of years after we launched, partly because our members were emailing me saying, please, can you put the hotels online? Because if I take your guidebook into work, then my boss will know that I'm booking my holiday and not working. <laughs> and so, of course, we went online. And nowadays, I think our role has changed. Back in those days when we started, it was about finding these places and giving them a voice because nobody knew about them. They were out there, but nobody knew about them. These days, of course, with research on the internet and the very large sites like Travago, like Booking.com, Priceline, Expedia, you can find these places everywhere. And so now I think we're very much the curators. That's our role. And internally, the reason that we exist is to inspire people to travel to extraordinary places with the people that they love. How does that translate in marketing terms, though? So our proposition to the customer is that we are a travel club for hotel lovers. You know, I wouldn't call myself an OTA to a customer. They probably wouldn't know what I was talking about. So we're a travel club. Why a travel club? Well, we decided upon a travel club for lots of reasons. And it's because we, we believe that a club is somewhere where like-minded people join, where you'll find other people like you who enjoy the same kind of things. It's a place where you feel or get looked after. It's a place where you could find inspiration and get real value. It's a place where you're recognized and rewarded. It's also a place that you're proud to be a part of, 
you've paid money to become, you know, come into this membership club, you, you are proud of it. And if you're proud of something, you tend to share that. And then, of course, the ultimate goal, it's a place where we hope you'll come back again and again. And so, very briefly, just to give you an idea of the size of Mr. and Mrs. Smith today, we have offices in London, Los Angeles, New York, Singapore, and Ibiza. Just two people there. <laughs> um, we have 1,000 hotels, 120 employees. We do about 300 bookings a day. Blah, blah numbers. I guess you would call us an SME. But we have a huge problem. And I'm not going to talk about Brexit or Frexit or Trump or the earthquakes in Italy or the Zika virus that has destroyed travel to a certain extent on the coastlines of the Caribbean, Mexico and South America. I'm not going to talk about the terrorism in Paris. No, no, no. Let's just imagine for a second that the world was perfect, that we could travel anywhere we wanted at any time without any worries. Right? Not, not very easy to imagine. Um, we still have a big problem. The travel industry is huge, it's hugely complex, and it's very competitive. And we have some 10-ton gorillas in the ring with us in the name, you know, with very deep pockets, such as Booking.com, Priceline, Expedia, some of whom are our partners, right? And our type of customers are very highly sought after. But in a world where we have almost conditioned the consumer to do 20 searches and look at over 38 websites before they make a booking, how on earth do we make sure that we are both the first click and the last click in that process? How do we make a splash in a very big pool? And the way I think that we do this is to think about not just serving intent. And what do I mean by that? I mean by that when a customer comes to your website or picks up the phone to you or chats to you or comments on your Facebook page, they're communicating with you. But by the time they've done that, most of the time, they will have already visited a lot of competitor websites. They will probably have clicked on your PPC ad, so you're paying Google. Um, they'd have been through TripAdvisor, so we're probably paying TripAdvisor as well for it. So what have we got to do? We've got to, we have got to serve that intent, of course, but not just serve it. We've got to get ahead of the game and create it. And just like we disrupted the guidebook space, we have to disrupt all the time in how we speak to our customers. We have to drive that intent. So I'm going to talk you through now the campaign that we've been running for the last two months. And it's been a build-up of a lot of work. Um, but it has been a su huge success for us, and so I wanted to share it with you today. It started with us positioning ourselves as an expert in our field. Okay? I thought, why should very large companies, the nameless, cookie-cutter, you know, faceless hotels and the big booking websites, define our category? We're experts in boutique hotels. Boutique hotels should be independent. They should be small. They should be beautiful. That's how the true definition of the word boutique. How can a 250 ho Yeah. Anyway, um, I could go on about that. But so define ourselves as experts. And so we created the Boutique Hotel Awards. Now, again, hotel awards parties or travel awards ceremonies are usually in a very large, fancy hotel with tables of people and a compare and MC giving out awards over a very lengthy period of time during which people get very drunk. And so we threw the rule book out, and we had a huge party in secret vaults in London. And normally, they're industry events. But we invited our customers. We wanted our customers to mix with our hoteliers. We wanted our customers to hear the hoteliers' stories of why they had won these awards. And we, of course, we invited all our employees and the press. And it was just a melange of, of great people all joined in this love of boutique hotels. And of course, we had the winners ahead of, slightly ahead of time. And to make this really wow, we engaged with an influencer called Polly Brown, also a photographer. 
And we sent her on a whistle-stop tour of every single one of the winning hotels. And what that gave us was incredible and unique content to use during the award ceremony, on the announcements, and in the follow-up. We announced the winners on the night on Instagram stories, and we had an unprecedented view. Each story got around 12,000 views in the 24 hours that they were up. We've got to remember as well, we'd use influencers for the judges, so that it all came together in this huge announcement. But it didn't just stop there. Of course, we wanted to leverage, and as I go through these, I hope you're seeing that these images are not the norm. It's not what you would expect from you know, a hotel imagery. It's not a little a bed with you know, perfect pillows. It's things that are messed up. It evokes that sense of naughtiness, of sexiness, of people going away and actually enjoying themselves in the hotel. So, of course, we used all this collateral, and we went online and offline. So we did the classic advertising, we did, obviously, Instagram, Facebook advertising. But we went out to our customers with, we reinvented the newspaper for it, and then sent them follow-ups up, follow with, the, with postcards, with all these unique images. And of course, then, the consumers started coming to our website and coming to us on the phone. And at that point, we start personalizing. Three of the boxes on our home page are personalized using any information that we have about the customer at that point. Obviously, we have more if they've logged in and less if they don't. But we've always got something, and we try and make it different for everybody. We started serving them this different content and using it to inform the search results as well. They can always change the search results to high and low, but we also have a recommended function. We also did email campaigns. And what I'm going to tell you now is the results of one small campaign, but it was echoed throughout the whole campaign over the last two months, and we're still working on it. Because we were able to send personalized emails, because we had such a lot of content, because the awards also, we'd created very different categories. So because we're Mr. and Mrs. Smith, I think only, us, well, only we could have the sexiest bedroom category. It's obviously the category that gets us the most press. Um, but we have some other interesting ones, like Best Date Night Bar and Local Hotel Hero. And all of these stories we started to share with customers on email. Now, we wrote 35% more emails during this campaign than any other campaign, but we sent fewer. How does that work? What we were actually doing is writing as many personalized and, and as many stories as we possibly could but personalizing it to the customers. And that meant that we didn't have to send so many, not so many brand mass marketing messages. And so people dropped out of certain core messages and only received the ones that were relevant to them. So what we had done is we'd created the, the intent. People had gone, wow, this is interesting. I want to come. We'd communicated then personally and relevantly to them. And we'd engaged them and converted them. That campaign saw 151% more revenue, 70% more opens, and 80% more click-through rates than any other campaign we'd done. Now, we don't do this alone. And I'm always interested in what other tools and techniques and companies are out there. I mean, it's a huge world out there. And there are new apps and marketing tools out there all the time. So I thought I'd share the ones that we use um, in case that's interesting for you. Of course, Adobe Salesforce, you know. Hmm? I, I think Adobe is missing. Adobe. <laughs> yeah. Um, Salesforce, you know. Uh, Sailthrough is our ESP. They have some very clever personalization tools. Uh, TMI in the middle and Cara, they are our ad serving um, and uh, online marketing media companies. Infinity is a very interesting one, because we are an offline company as well as an online company. We have a 24-7 team around the world with sales and support for our customers. And so people pick up the phone to us all the time. And we wanted to make sure that we can attribute that correctly. Infinity is a plugin that allows you to do that. It's very clever. 
sales cycle, help us to bring the customer back to our site and engage with them post -book, um, in the, in the drop-off of the basket. And of course, double-click other people who make the attribution model happen. And of course, if we work with these best-in-class companies and new tools and techniques out there, what that leaves is time for us to actually do what we're good at, which is the content creation and feeding the content monster that we have created.